Hello, I'm Victor Strandberg, and we're about to begin another session in our studies of the poetry of T.S. Eliot. Uh, in this session, we'll take up his poem, Chironchin, the poem that is, we might say, a stepping stone to the wasteland. Originally, uh, it was part of the wasteland. Certainly, some features of it continue to show up in the wasteland. But uh, for today, we'll examine this poem. And then uh, in our next session, I plan to present some preliminary material for our study of the wasteland, after which we'll go on with the poem itself. <clears throat> The title Gerontion is a cognate of gerontology, a study of old age. So the speaker here is an old man. We might think of him as Prufrock 40 years later. Under the title is a passage from Shakespeare. I think it's in The Tempest. I didn't check it. Thou hast neither youth nor age but as it were, an after-dinner sleep dreaming of both. The point, I think, of the epigraph is that Gerontin's life has simply flowed away like a dream. Uh, not much of it is left now. He's an old man. He will consider his future toward the end of the poem, uh, but he's mo mostly contemplating the past and trying to see if there were any sources of meaning in his life. His problem is that he's lived a life in which nothing has happened. And as we look through the poem, we'll find Giranchin exploring four potential sources of a meaningful life and finding each of them empty. Behind it all is the problem the continuing problem of naturalism, whether it's possible for anyone to find a permanently meaningful life in a world in which there is no supernature, a life in which, as Nabokov put it in the opening sentence of his memoir, Speak Memory, our lives, he said, or more correctly, common sense tells us that our lives are a brief crack of light between two eternities of darkness. That is a naturalistic problem that continues to afflict T.S. Eliot as he moves through this poem and through the wasteland soon to follow. We begin with the spectacle of this old man, Gerontion in a dry month, being read to by a boy. That is a very ironic stance for this old man. If he had had a life in which anything had happened, he should be telling the boy stories about important events in his life. Instead, since nothing has happened, he is being read to by a boy, being entertained. We go on then with the first of these potential sources of a meaningful life, even perhaps in a naturalistic age, a life of heroic adventure. I was neither at the hot gates. The hot gates would be a literal translation of Thermopylae, that great battle hundreds of years before the time of Christ when Leonidas and his 300 Spartans, in popular history at least, held off the immense Persian army. And so they've gone down in history as figures of great valor and significance. Gerontion was not at the hot gates. Behind the poem, of course, is the devastating spectacle of World War I, the greatest war in history, the most utterly useless war in history, a war that made the world unsafe for democracy. Uh, it was not the war to end all wars, as Woodrow Wilson said, 
but it made certain there would be future, even worse, wars. Turunchen did not participate in World War I, nor did T.S. Eliot. Eliot tried to enlist in the United States Army. He had patriotic feelings, but he was rejected. Even though they were looking for cannon fodder, uh, 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 including almost anyone able to walk. But Eliot was a walking skeleton, very thin, and he had a double hernia, which would be seriously incapacitating for a man acting at the front lines. We proceed with this view of heroic action as a possible source of meaning. I was neither at the hot gates, nor fought in the warm rain, heaving a cutlass. Uh, perhaps uh, we might imagine Gerontion as a pirate, or maybe a, an explorer uh, centuries earlier, uh, but of course he was not capable of doing any of that either. Instead, he spent his whole life his adult life at least, in a run-down tenement section of the city, possibly even a slum. He proceeds to tell us then, my house is a decayed house, and the Jew squats on the windowsill, the owner. Uh, here at this point, I think we need to address the issue of Eliot's anti-Semitism. It has shown up earlier in the poem Burbank with a Bidecker, Bleistein with a cigar, the owner of a brothel. Uh, likewise, in Sweeney Among the Nightingales, we had Rachel Ney, born Rabinovich, a Jewish madam of this brothel. And we could find other instances in Eliot's early poetry of anti-Semitic sentiment. In this case, the Jew is uh, spelled with a small j. And um, instead of sitting in the window, as a Gentile would, he squats on the windowsill. Uh, and as we proceed then, a Gentile would be born in the, one of these cities, Brussels, London, Antwerp. Being a Jew, he was spawned there. We can't excuse Eliot for these sentiments, but I think we should observe that they were very commonplace in American literature before the rise of Hitler and the Nazis in 1933. You have Hemingway and Robert Cohn, an ugly American, in The Sun Also Rises. You have Fitzgerald and his Maya Wolfsheim, a gangster, in the Great Gatsby, and we could cite quite a few other instances spread across American literature of bigotry against Jews. This, however, I believe is the last instance that we'll see of Eliot displaying anti-Semitic feelings in his poetry. We proceed. The goat coughs at night in the field overhead. Now, Eliot doesn't tell us what he meant by that detail, but I think we could surmise that one meaning, at least, is that Gerontion is an insomniac. Like some other characters in Eliot's poetry, I'm thinking of Rhapsody on a Winter Night, when a character uh, who's unable to sleep, moves through the streets of the city until four o'clock when he climbs into bed again, unable to sleep mainly because of naturalistic anxiety, fear, perhaps of death, fear in a handful of dust is the way Eliot describes humankind in the wasteland itself. The goat coughs at night in the field overhead then, the woman keeps the kitchen making tea. We've seen that motif before. In a meaningless life, social ritual, trivial rituals, are basically the only way to structure one's existence. 
back in portrait of a lady after she has lost a young man. She announces, I shall sit here serving tea to friends. Or we had back in Prufrock, the taking of a toast and tea. It's that idea perhaps uh, of measuring out our lives in coffee spoons, a minimal mode of existence devoid of serious meaning. We move then from heroic action as an unavailable source of meaning for Gerontion, and we move to the second potential source of a meaningful life in modern times. In this case, it will be religious faith, more specifically Christian faith, as a source of meaning for hundreds of millions of people around the world, and which up until modern times seem to be available even to most intellectuals. But because of the rise of the natural sciences and its attendant philosophy, naturalism, uh, this possible source of meaning also comes under unfortunate skepticism. We begin this part of the poem with a citation from Sacred Writ, a citation found in both the Hebrew Bible, the Old Testament, and the Christian Bible, the New Testament, quoting, signs are taken for wonders, we would see a sign. Now the sign in question in the Bible would be some supernatural manifestation of God's power or his presence or his uh, anointment of a messenger who will demonstrate the sign, Jesus in the New Testament. And I would pick Moses in the Old Testament as an excellent example of displaying a sign. I'm thinking of when Moses went before Pharaoh to demand, let my people go. And then Moses threw his staff down and it turned into a serpent on the floor. In the case of Jesus, of course, we see many signs, supernatural interventions, raising the dead, healing the sick, turning water into wine, and so forth. Each one a sign, a supernatural intervention showing God's power and presence and anointing of this particular biblical figure. Now here in the 20th century, of course, we cannot see a sign. There is no supernature. There cannot be a supernatural intervention. Then there cannot be a miracle. And so we have the word within a word, unable to speak a word. If we're thinking of the word of God, well, there is no God. So obviously there cannot be a word of God as the Bible would posit. The um, word within a word swaddled in darkness. And I would think we can say this is naturalistic darkness, the lack of a belief to live by, a belief that would give ultimate meaning, the old certitudes put forward by the church for these several thousand years. Darkness replacing those beliefs. Now, ironically, Though belief in Christian salvation in a Christian afterlife is no longer credible, we nevertheless get a sense of judgment, harsh judgment against Gerontion in Christian terms as we proceed. In the juvescence of the year, in the springtime, came Christ the tiger. Jesus is never described as a tiger, in the Gospels. He is the Lamb of God. But here he is a tiger because of this sense of self-judgment, a sense of inadequacy, a sense of spiritual failure on Gerontion's part, and we could surmise on T.S. Eliot's part as we proceed. Gerontion then, perhaps Eliot, looks with envy 
at what comes next, an international Christian communion service. And of course, as the church universal, spread across the world by the European empires, uh, Christianity is an international religion. And we have these figures then who do believe, uh, who share the communion service across that geographic range. To be eaten, to be divided, to be drunk, the communion wafer, the communion wine, among whispers, which to me suggest a mood of reverence. By Mr. Silvero, he would be an Italian or a Spaniard, we'd, we'd presume, uh, to be um, taken by Mr. Silvero with caressing hands, again, a gesture of reverence by a devout Christian. At Limoges, uh, who walked all night in the next room, uh, we could perhaps have various interpretations of that. In the context that we have, this seems to me another gesture of devotion. The communion also taken by Hakagawa, obviously a Japanese name, uh, suggesting uh, the far side of the world from Eliot, bowing among the Titians, by Madame de Turnquist. Now that sounds French, uh, except that Turnquist is a Scandinavian name probably Swedish. And of course, Fräulein von Kulp would be definitely German, all participating in this central sacrament of the Christian faith. By contrast, Gerontian says, I have no ghosts. For me, there is no spiritual universe. Uh, there is no supernatural order behind this visible world, uh, and so I cannot participate. We have to give up on Christianity as a potential source of meaning. The intellectual life of this time uh, makes it not credible. We to the third possible source of a meaningful life, and the transition between them is a question. After such knowledge, what forgiveness? Now the question is, what is Eliot thinking of in the word knowledge? After such knowledge, what forgiveness? Unforgivable knowledge. In my opinion, this would be knowledge of naturalism that makes faith impossible. What forgiveness suggests something Jesus said in the Gospels, that God will forgive any sin all that is required is that you ask forgiveness sincerely. Most theologians, uh, excuse me, Jesus went on to say, beware the unpardonable sin. Uh, but he did not define exactly what that sin is. Most theologians, it seems, believe that the unpardonable sin is despair. And the reason it is unpardonable is that Despair causes a lack of belief, and the lack of belief in turn makes asking forgiveness not feasible. That's why it is the unpardonable sin in this theological discourse. We move then to the third possible source of a meaningful life, and even in a naturalistic world, this source of meaning does seem viable. Hundreds of millions of people have been conscripted to it in the 20th century. I am talking about the idea of participating in the march of history. Uh, we have various ideologies that have flaunted that flag, fascism, uh, Bolshevism, uh, Nazism, uh, fanatical ideologies, that have indeed uh, gathered a large number of true believers in the effort to build a better society as a source of a meaningful life, to participate in that grand scheme. Now, in virtually every case, 
what has happened is building a much, much worse society. And Eliot, even back around 1919 when he wrote this poem, could foresee these consequences, the march of history as a deceptive uh, path to chaos. So uh, think now, he says, history has many cunning passages, contrived corridors. That particular phrase, contrived corridors, appears to be a reference to the Treaty of Versailles that was coming into play that year, 1919. And in it, parts of Germany were given to other countries, including this part of Germany given to Poland. Uh, there was a city called Danzig in Germany, given to Poland, the name was changed to Dansk, and um, Poland was given a corridor of land across Germany, northern Germany, to Dansk, uh, back in the settlement after World War I. Uh, Hitler, in his war aims, intended to reclaim the lands lost by Germany in World War I. And as it turned out, this very same contrived corridor, the Polish corridor to Danzig, was the flashpoint of World War II 20 years later in 1939. Hitler demanded uh, the territory and um, started the war accordingly. History then is a chaotic mess. It uh, deceives us with whispering ambitions, guides us by vanities. It gives too late what's not believed in, or if still believed, in memory only, reconsidered passion. Think, neither fear nor courage saves us. That verb saves seems to reflect back again to religious thinking. Salvation. And certainly, if that's your goal, history has nothing to offer. So we move then from this third potential source of meaning, participation in the march of history. Once again, we move toward a fourth potential source of meaning with a sort of religious reference as a bridge between them. He says, these tears are shaken from the wrath-bearing tree. Well, if you try to think what kind of a tree is that, the most plausible answer appears to be the cross on which Jesus died and through which he offered eternal life to believers. For Gerontion is an unbeliever, of course, there is that sense still hanging over of Christ the tiger the wrath-bearing tree, not salvation-bearing, for an unbeliever. He goes on and foresees his own death. As an old man, it could be quite soon now. Think at last we have not reached conclusion. Still searching for meaning without finding any, right to the end. We have not reached conclusion when I stiffen in a rented house. This could well be the tenement house owned by the Jewish uh, figure that we saw earlier, or it could be a metaphor for his physical body. I stiffen in a rented house, a temporary dwelling. As we move on to the fourth potential source of meaning, it, like the march of history, is something that might be possible even in a naturalistic world. It is a source of meaning that has been taken up seriously and propagated by many modern artists, namely the idea of cultivating one's private garden, the way Voltaire put it at the end of Candide. That is to say, the world out there is a chaotic mess, but within one's own circuit, one can establish a pleasant and meaningful life. One does that mainly through human relationships, and above all, perhaps, in the most intimate of those relationships, that between marriage partners. Now, I asked one of the greatest of all T.S. Eliot scholars, the first and the greatest, Grover Smith. 
what was going on in this conversation, uh, we could call it, I guess, more strictly a monologue of Jiranshin. Who was he talking to, I asked Grover Smith, when he says, I would meet you on this honestly. I that was near your heart was removed therefrom, etc. And uh, Grover Smith told me uh, he thinks it's Jiranshin talking to his wife, which is to say T.S. Eliot talking to his wife. Now, this was a very bad marriage. Both parties had nervous breakdowns. Uh, they were both uh, hypochondriac, uh, in addition to which they had very serious actual ailments on both sides. Uh, they both were, uh, I think you could say, high strung, that is to say, prone to nervous exhaustion. And they worked in a negative way on each other. But as we trace what happened now in the marriage, whether it's Chirantian's or Eliot's, uh, let's see what the basis of the marriage was. I that was near your heart was removed therefrom to lose beauty in terror. Well, it does seem that beauty was one of the features that attracted Eliot to this woman. He hardly knew her maybe for two or three months before they got married in 1915. In my own view, he was trying to replace this huge vacancy uh, in his soul left by the death of his soul mate, Jean Verdinal, in the Dardanelles campaign of the spring of 1915. I lost beauty in terror, and this could be this naturalistic terror that he's talking about, which could impinge on his relationships with other people. Then we go on to something much more personal. I have lost my passion. Now, this could be because Gerontin is an old man. The hormones are no longer as abundant as they once were. Or, um, it could be because, if we're speaking of Eliot, of rumors that he was impotent. But Eliot himself points to something else here. I have lost my passion. Why should I need to keep it, since what is kept must be adulterated? That word is a pun for adultery. And indeed, there was adultery in Eliot's marriage, even in the first year, when Vivian Eliot would still be technically a bride. Um, the adulterer, in this case, was Bertrand Russell, T.S. Eliot's old professor at Harvard, who happened to cross Eliot in London, asked how they were doing, found out that they were in serious financial difficulty and offered his flat in London as a place to stay. They did stay there, the Elliots. Sometimes Bertrand Russell stayed there too in the extra room. They also lived a trois in various other places, a cottage uh, out in the country, a place at the beach. And um, Bertrand Russell, who was a notorious ladies man did indeed seduce Eliot's wife. And the affair went on for perhaps a year and a half or two years. So uh, that may be why Gerontian, perhaps Eliot, has lost his passion. Uh, what is left, or what is kept, I should say, must be adulterated. We go on with Gerontian speaking of the decrepitude of old age. I have lost all five senses, my sight, smell, hearing, taste, and touch. And that, of course, would affect the intimacy of a marriage bond. How should I use them for your closer contact, he says. So it turns out that this fourth potential source of meaning, we started with the life of heroic adventure. We went on to the concept of Christian faith. Uh, we then went to the march of history. And here we turn our back on all of that for a life of personal, private uh, enrichment of one's emotional life and spiritual life 
and find that none of them will avail. They are all empty of meaning. As we end this poem, Chiranchen, we then look to the future. As an old man, perhaps, there isn't much of a future for Chiranchen, but he does know that in that future, he will pass away. And we consider that prospect as we end the poem. These, he says, and I think when he says these, he's speaking of the five senses that are now decrepit. These with a thousand small deliberations protract the profit of their chilled delirium. A chilled delirium, I think, because the five senses uh, no longer function as they once did, producing perhaps the delirious uh, experiences uh, that were more available in his youth. What will the spider do, he says, thinking of his own death? Suspend its operations? Will the weevil delay? He thinks now of people he used to know who are dead. De Balacci, Fresca, Mrs. Camel. And what happened to those people? We have a naturalistic answer to the question. Those people and others whirled beyond the circuit of the shuddering bear, for us that would be the Big Dipper, in fractured atoms. That's what death means, to be reduced to fractured atoms. Nothing more than that. Even so, in a life in which nothing has happened, there was no adventure, no meaning. At last, Geronchin thinks there may be something interesting about to happen. So we have a flaring up of romantic imagery describing his forthcoming death. He thinks of himself going around Cape Horn, that extremely stormy ocean uh, that uh, has been the bane of many sailing ships over the centuries. He thinks of death as a trip around Cape Horn through that tumultuous exit, that passageway, into the Pacific Ocean, a peaceful ocean, once you get past the stormy Cape. So he pictures uh, then his exit from the world as gull against the wind. That's kind of a romantic image. Uh, we proceed in the windy straits of Belle Isle or running on the horn, Cape Horn, white feathers in the snow. And what we get then is a sense of death as something white, the gull, absorbed into whiteness. Uh, a, a sort of um, quiet uh, disappearance. Then we lapse from that fairly romantic sense of a passage from this world into the Pacific. We lapse back to where the poem started. An old man in a sleepy corner a tenant of the house, thoughts of a dry brain in a dry season. Uh, we'll leave Giranjan at that, and in our next session, we'll begin the preliminaries to the wasteland.